From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, this is the 177th semi-annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church, and music for this session by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Communications. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. Thomas S. Monson, First Counselor in the First Presidency of the Church, will conduct this session. We welcome you this afternoon to the fifth and concluding session of the 177th Semiannual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Gordon B. Hinckley, who presides at this conference, has asked that I, Brother Monson, conduct this session. We extend our greetings and blessings to members of the Church and many friends everywhere who are participating in these proceedings by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. The music for this session will be provided by the Tabernacle Choir under the direction of Craig Jessup and Matt Quilberg with Andrew Unsworth and Richard Elliott at the organ. The choir will open these services by singing Beautiful Zion, Built Above. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Robert S. Wood of the Seventy. Following the invocation, the choir will sing Our Prayer to Thee with soloist Scott Miller. Elders Robert D. Hales and Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles will then address us. And following their remarks, we shall hear from Brother Daniel K. Judd, First Counselor in the Sunday School General Presidency, and Elder Octaviano Tenorio of the Seventy, singing by the choir.
Holy and eternal Father, it is with gratitude that we begin this final session of the 177th semi-annual conference of thy church. We are grateful for the words and music of inspiration that we have heard, for the prophetic counsel that we have received, and for, once again, the revelatory manifestation that thou continue to guide this church and to speak to thy prophet. Now, Father, prepare our hearts and our minds as we begin this concluding session, that indeed the words of life and of truth will penetrate deep down inside of us, that we may leave here resolved to more perfectly follow our discipleship of thy divine Son, that we may exemplify in our life who he is and whom he would have us become, that we may bind ourselves in all holiness to go together as a people, that thy word and thy will may advance through all the world, touching many hearts and opening many minds, that thy truth may indeed be established throughout the earth. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
we do pray and give gratitude for the blessings which were given. As we begin the concluding session of this historic conference, I join you in expressing gratitude for the privilege of sustaining President Henry B. Eyring as in the First Presidency, Elder Cook in the Quorum of the Twelve, and Elder Gonzalez in the Seven Presidents of Seventy. I offer them my love and support and testify they are called of God by a living prophet, President Gordon B. Hinckley, according to the spirit of revelation and prophecy. It is that that I'd like to talk to you today. The events of these past two days teach us the need for revelation in the Lord's work and personal revelation in our own lives. Personal revelation is the way we know for ourselves the most important truths of our existing, the living reality of God, our eternal Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the truthfulness of the restored gospel, and God's purpose and direction for us. Much of what I know about personal revelation I have learned from examples from prophets, both ancient and modern. This afternoon I would like to share a few of these personal examples and pray that they will inspire each of us to seek the blessings of personal revelation in our own lives. As a young regional representative, I was assigned to assist Elder Marion G. Romney in reorganizing a stake. During the long, quiet ride to the conference, our conversation turned to the spiritual dimensions of our assignment. Elder Romney taught me about how the Lord blesses us with revelation. Robert, he said, I have learned that when we are on the Lord's errand, we have His blessings to accomplish whatever we are asked to do. Elder Romney further explained that we would arrive in a distant city, kneel in prayer, interview priesthood holders, kneel in prayer again, and the Holy Ghost would reveal to us the person whom the Lord had chosen to be the new stake president. He promised me. It would be one of the great spiritual experiences of my life, and it was. Each of us has been sent to earth by our Heavenly Father to merit eternal life, and this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. How do we know the Father and the Son for ourselves? By personal revelation. Personal revelation is the way Heavenly Father helps us know Him and His Son, to learn to live the gospel and endure to the end in righteousness that qualifies us to return back into their presence for eternal life. You may ask, how do we seek personal revelation? Paul counseled the saints to rely on the Spirit rather than the wisdom of the world. To obtain that spirit, we begin with prayer. President Lorenzo Snow had studied the gospel for several years before joining the Church, but he did not receive a witness until three weeks after his baptism, when he retired in secret prayer. He tells us, The Spirit of God descended upon me, he said. Oh, the joy and happiness I felt! For I then received a perfect knowledge that God lives, that Jesus is the Son of God, and of the restoration of the holy priesthood and the fullness of the gospel." End of quote. I have learned that prayer provides a firm foundation for personal revelation, but more is required. While still a regional representative, I had the opportunity to learn from another apostle, Elder Boyd K. Packer. We were assigned to reorganize a stake and began by kneeling in prayer together. After interviewing the priesthood leaders and having prayer, 
Elder Packer suggested that we walk around the building together. As we walked, he demonstrated a vital principle of seeking personal revelation, the principle the Lord taught Oliver Cowdery. Behold, you must study it out in your mind. We pondered our assignment, counseled together. I listened to an apostle, and the voice of the Spirit came. When we went back, we prayed and studied further, and then we were prepared to receive revelation. Revelation comes on the Lord's timetable, which often means we must move forward in faith, even though we haven't received all the answers we desire. As a general authority, I was assigned to help reorganize a stake presidency under the direction of Elder Ezra Taft Benson. After praying, interviewing, studying, and praying again, Elder Benson asked me if, if I knew who would be the, the next president. I said I had not received that inspiration yet. He looked at me for a long time and replied he hadn't either. However, we were inspired to ask three worthy priesthood holders to speak in the Sunday evening session of conference. Moments after the third speaker began, the Spirit prompted me that he should be the new stake president. I looked over at President Benson and saw tears streaming down his face. Revelation had been given to both of us. But only by continuing to seek our Heavenly Father's will as we move forward in faith. Early in my church service, Elder Harold B. Lee taught this lesson when he came to organize a new stake in the district where we were living. Elder, La Elder Lee asked me, as a newly sustained bishop, if I would join him at a press conference. There, an intense young reporter challenged Elder Lee. He said to him, You call yourself a prophet. When was the last time you had revelation? And what was it about? Elderly paused, looked directly at him, and responded in a sweet way. It was yesterday afternoon, about three o'clock. We were praying about who should be called as the president of the new stake and it was made known to us who that individual should be. The reporter's heart changed. I will never forget the spirit that came into that room as Elder Lee bore his powerful witness of the revelation that he had received by those faithfully seeking to do the Lord's will. As faithful children, youth, parents, teachers, and leaders, we may receive personal revelation more frequently than we realize. The more we receive and acknowledge personal revelation, the more our testimonies grow. As a bishop, my testimony grew each time I received revelations to extend calling towards members. That testimony has been strengthened each time I witness general authorities and officers. Area 70s and stake presence called or given new assignments. More importantly, I am strengthened by my personal revelations I receive in my role as a son of God, a husband, and a father. I am so thankful for the guidance and direction of the Spirit in our home as we seek for direction in family matters. For all of us, our personal revelations reflect the pattern of revelation received by prophets, as recounted in the scriptures. Adam and Eve called upon the name of the Lord and received personal revelation, including the knowledge of the Savior. Enoch, Abraham, Moses sought for the welfare of their people and were given marvelous revelations recorded in the Pearl of Great Price. Elijah's personal revelation came through a still small voice. Daniel's came in a dream. Peter's personal revelation came and was, he was given a testimony that Jesus is the Christ. 
Lehi and Nephi received revelations about the Savior and the plan of salvation, and virtually all of the Bible and Book of Mormon prophets received revelations to warn, teach, strengthen, and comfort them and their people. After much prayer in the temple, President Spencer W. Kimball received the revelation on the priesthood. After praying providing about providing temple blessings to more members of the Church, President Hinckley received revelation about the building of small temples. Prophets received personal revelations to help them in their own lives and in directing the earthly affairs of the Church. Our responsibility is to seek personal revelation for ourselves and for the responsibility the Lord has given us. These past weeks, President Hinckley has been seeking revelation about the callings that would be announced in this conference. About a month ago, in our Thursday Temple meeting of the First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve, I listened as he offered a simple, sincere prayer for spiritual guidance. The answer to his heartfelt prayer has now been presented to all of us. Do we see the pattern of revelation in the lives of prophets? Are the threads of that pattern also woven through our lives? We know the pattern centers on the Atonement. We receive the blessings of Atonement when we repeat our sins and keep the commandments. When we repent of our sins and keep the commandments, and then we covenant to do when we were baptized to renew that covenant each week as we partake of the sacrament. As we continue in righteousness, we qualify ourselves to say with Samuel, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord answers, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, your ears, for they hear. We prepare to receive personal revelation, as the prophets do, by studying the scriptures, fasting, praying, and building faith. Faith is the key. Remember Joseph's preparation for the first vision. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. By unwavering faith, we learn for ourselves that it is by faith that miracles are wrought. Generally, those miracles will not be physical demonstration of God's power, parting of the Red Sea, raising of the dead, breaking down prison walls, or the appearance of heavenly messengers. By design, most miracles are spiritual demonstration of God's power, tender mercies gently bestowed through impressions, ideas, feelings of assurance, solutions to problems, strength to meet challenges, and comfort to bear disappointments and sorrow. These miracles come to us as we endure what the scriptures call a trial of our faith. Sometimes that trial is the time it takes before an answer is received. When President David O. McKay was a young man herding cattle, he sought a witness, but it did not come until many years after while serving his mission in Scotland. He wrote, It was a manifestation for which a doubting youth I had secretly prayed on the hillside and in meadow. It was an assurance to me that sincere prayer is answered sometime, somewhere. End of quote. The answer may be, not now. Be patient and wait. I testify that on the hillside or the meadow, in the grove or closet, now or in the eternities to come, the Savior's world words to each of us will be fulfilled. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. While we are commanded not to seek after signs, we are commanded to seek earnestly the best gifts. These gifts include the Holy Ghost, and personal revelation. That revelation will come line upon line, precept upon precept. As the Savior said, And unto him that receiveth the Lord, the Lord will give more. As we go forth from this conference, 
I call upon each of us to seek more and receive more of the Spirit of God. The Savior prayed that his disciples in the new world would receive that Spirit. Then, as an example to all of us, he departed from his disciples and in prayer thanked his Heavenly Father for bestowing it. Let us follow his example, pray for the Spirit of God, giving thanks for the marvelous blessings in our lives. I bear my special witness that Jesus Christ lives and leads his church through a living prophet, President Gordon B. Hinckley. I know, I know that President Hinckley leads this church by revelation. In the words of Alma, Behold, I say unto you, these things are made known unto me by the Holy Spirit of God. Behold, I have fasted and prayed many days, and now I do of myself. I know that they are true. For the Lord God had made them manifest unto me, and this is the spirit of revelation which is in me, that each of us may receive that spirit, obtain the blessings of personal revelation, and know for ourselves that these things are true is my heartfelt prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Since truth is the only meaningful foundation upon which we can make wise decisions, how can one then establish what is really true? Increasingly, more people are finding that making wise decisions is becoming more and more difficult because of the ultra-interconnected world in which we live. Constantly forced into our consciousness is an incessant barrage of counsel, advice, and promotions. It's done by a bewildering array of media, internet, and other means. On a given subject, we can receive multiple strongly delivered, carefully crafted messages with solutions. But often, two of these solutions can be diametrically opposed. No wonder some are confused and are not sure how to make the right decisions. To further complicate matters, others try to persuade us that our decisions must be socially acceptable and politically correct. Some pondering of that approach will reveal how wrong it is, since social and political structures differ widely over the world and can dramatically change with time. The folly of using that message of making choices is apparent. There are two ways to find truth, both useful, provided we follow the laws upon which they are predicated. The first is the scientific method. It can require analysis of data to confirm a theory or alternatively establish a valid principle through experimentation. The scientific method is a valuable way of seeking truth. However, it has two limitations. First, we never can be sure we've identified absolute truth, though we often draw nearer and nearer to it. Second, sometimes, no matter how earnestly we apply the method, we can get the wrong answer. The best way of finding truth is simply go to the origin of all truth and ask, or respond to inspiration. For success, two ingredients are essential. First, unwavering faith in the source of all truth. Second, a willingness to keep God's commandments, to keep open spiritual communication with Him. Elder Robert D. Hales has just spoken to us about that personal revelation and how to obtain it. What have we learned from the scientific approach to discovering truth? An example will illustrate, try as I might, I am not able, even in the smallest degree, to comprehend the extent, depth, and stunning grandeur of what our Holy Father Elohim has permitted to be revealed by the scientific method. 
If we were capable of moving outward into space, we'd first see our Earth as the astronauts. Farther out, we would have grandstand view of the sun and its orbiting planets. They would appear as a small circle of objects within an enormous panorama of glittering stars. Were we to continue the outward journey, we'd have a celestial view of our Milky Way spiral with over 100 billion stars rotating in a circular path, their orbits controlled by gravity around a concentrated central region. Beyond that, we could look towards a group of galaxies called the Virgo Cluster that some feel includes our Milky Way estimated to be about 50 million light years away. Beyond that, we'd encounter galaxies 10 billion light years away that the Hubble telescope has photographed. The dizzying enormity of that distance is suggested by noting that light travels 700 million miles an hour. Even from this extraordinary perspective, there would not be the slightest evidence of approaching any limit to God the Father's creations. As awe-inspiring as this incredible view of the heavens would present, there's another considerably consideration equal, e capable of confirming the unfathomable capacities of our Father in heaven. Were we to move in the opposite direction, to explore the structure of matter, we could get a close-up view of the double helix molecule of DNA. That is the extraordinarily self-duplicating molecular structure that controls the makeup of our physical body. Further exploration would bring us to the level of an atom with its protons, neutrons, and electrons that we've heard about. Were we able to penetrate further into the mysteries of the most fundamental makeup of creation? We come to the limit of our current understanding. In the last 70 years, much has been learned about the structure of matter. A standard model for fundamental particles and interactions has been developed. It's based on experimentation that has established the existence of fundamental particles designated as quarks, and others are called leptons. This model explains the pattern of nuclear binding and the decay of matter, but it does not yet provide a successful explanation for the forces of gravity. Also, some feel that even more powerful tools and those used to acquire a current understanding of matter might reveal additional fundamental particles. So there's yet more of Father in Heaven's creations to be understood by the scientific method. We can see the scientific method has brought about an extraordinary expansion of our understanding as the Lord has inspired gifted men who may not understand who created these things, nor for what purpose. Many of these may not even recognize such inspiration and give credit to God for the origin of their contributions. I was comforted recently as Elder Henry B. Eyring shared an experience that his gifted father had in a meeting with other outstanding scientists. He asked them, if their research indicated the existence of a superior organizing intelligence, they confirmed each one their conviction that such an intelligence exists. Limited as it is, our understanding of Father's creations indicates that mostly vacant space, even those things we consider as solid, tangible, firm, when viewed at enormous magnification in the heavens or minute matter are mostly vacant space that God our Father perfectly controls 
and uses for his exalted purposes. What if we learned about truth through revelation? Centuries ago, God the Father permitted some of his prophets to view far more of his vast creations perfectly through the eye of the Holy Spirit. He also explained why he had created them. For behold, this is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Enoch was one of those prophets. He observed the God of heaven weep as he saw how the power and influence of Satan had turned many on earth to evil. Enoch declared, how is it that thou canst weep, seeing that thou art holy, and from all eternity to all eternity? And were it possible that men could number the millions of earths like this, it would not be a beginning to the number of thy creations, and thy curtains are stretched out still, and yet thou art just. Thou art merciful and kind forever, and not but peace, justice, and truth is the habitation of thy throne. And mercy shall go before thy face and have no end. How is it that thou canst weep? The Lord said unto Enoch, Behold, these thy brethren, they are the workmanship of mine own hands. And I gave them their knowledge, and I gave unto man his agency. And unto thy brethren I have given a commandment, that they should love one another, and that they should choose me their father. But behold, they are without affection, and they hate their own blood. Well, did God the Father say to Moses, Worlds without number have I created, and I also created them for mine own purpose. And by the Son I created them, which is mine only begotten. There are many worlds, and innumerable are they unto man. But all things are numbered unto me, for they are mine, and I know them. The knowledge of this truth Truth is of little value unless we apply it in making correct decisions. Consider for a moment a, a man, heavily overweight, approaching a bakery display. In his mind are these thoughts. The doctor told you not to eat any more of that. It's not good for you. It gives you momentary gratification of appetite. You'll feel uncomfortable all the rest of the day after it. You've decided not to have any more. Then he hears himself say, I'll have two of those almond twists and a couple of donuts. <laughs> One more time won't hurt. I'll do it just once more, and this will be the last time. The process of identifying truth sometimes necessitates enormous effort coupled with profound faith in our Father and his glorified Son. God intended that it be so, to forge your worthy character. Worthy character will strengthen your capacity to respond obediently to the direction of the Spirit as you make vital decisions. Righteous character is what you're becoming. It's more important than what you own, what you've learned, or what goals you've accomplished. It allows you to be trusted. Righteous character provides the foundation and spiritual strength. It enables you in times of trial and testing to make difficult, extremely important decisions correctly, even when they seem overpowering. I testify that neither Satan nor any other power can weaken or destroy your growing character. Only you can do that through disobedience. 
understand and apply this vital principle to your life. Your exercise of faith builds character. Fortified character expands your capacity to exercise greater faith. Thus, your confidence in making correct decisions is enhanced. And the strengthening cycle continues. The more your character is fortified, the more enabled you are to exercise the power of faith for yet stronger character. With the enormity of what we can in just the smallest way begin to understand, and certainly in no way fully comprehend, how grateful we must be that this God of unfathomable capacities is our Father. He's a loving, understanding, compassionate, patient Father. He has created us, us as His children. He treats us as beloved son or daughter. He makes us feel loved, appreciated, valuable, and dear to Him. He's given us His plan of mercy and equipped us when obedient to make correct decisions. He has provided through His Holy Son a means for us to live, to grow, to develop, and to place ourselves squarely on the path to be eternally under His guidance and influence. I love our Father in Heaven beyond my capacity to express. In all humility, I solemnly bear witness that this creative master of unparalleled capacities is our compassionate Holy Father. His beloved Son laid His life down in absolute obedience to His Father to break the bonds of death and to become our Master, our Redeemer, our Savior. While I do not fully comprehend their, all their capacities, I understand something of their power to express intensely their love. Humbly, I bear solemn witness that they live and love us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. As a young man, I worked with my father and brothers raising cattle and horses on a ranch in southern Utah and northern Arizona. My father taught us that when we wanted to catch one of our horses to ride, all we had to do was to put a handful of grain into a bucket and shake it for several seconds. It didn't matter if the horses were in a corral or a large field, they would come on the run to eat the grain. We could then gently slip a bridle over their heads while they were eating. I was amazed that such a simple process seemed to always work so well. But on some occasions, when we didn't want to take the time to get the grain from the barn, we would put dirt in the bucket and shake it, attempting to trick the horses into thinking that we had grain for them to eat. When they discovered our deception, some of the horses stayed, but others would run away and be nearly impossible to catch. It often took several days to regain their trust. We learned that taking the time to consistently feed our horses grain made them much easier to work with and provided them with increased nourishment and greater strength. Even though many years have passed since my days on the ranch, the experience I have just described has helped me as I have considered the following question. What can we, as teachers and leaders in the Church, do to provide increased doctrinal and spiritual nourishment for those we serve? Elder Jeffrey R. Holland has taught, Most people don't come to Church looking merely for a few new gospel facts or to see old friends, though all of that is important. They come looking and seeking for a spiritual experience. They want peace. They want their faith fortified and their hope renewed. They want, in short, to be nourished by the good word of God, 
to be strengthened by the powers of heaven. Those of us who are called upon to speak or teach or lead have an obligation to help provide that as best we possibly can. The Savior and His servants have not only taught us the importance of helping others be nourished by the good word of God, they have also provided inspired direction concerning our teaching and leading how it can best be accomplished. Section 50 of the Doctrine and Covenants is one of many references that provides such valuable counsel. After acknowledging the concerns that existed in some of the early branches of the Church, the Savior instructed a group of leaders concerning the solution to the problems they were facing. His instructions began by asking a vital question. Wherefore, I, the Lord, ask you this question, Unto what were ye ordained? The Lord's familiar response follows in verse 14, To preach my gospel by the Spirit, even the Comforter, which was sent forth to teach the truth. The answers to the problems the saints were facing in 1831 are the same for the challenges we are facing today. We are to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Ghost. Section 50 includes several vital keys to providing nourishment for those we teach and those we lead. The first key is found in the Savior's admonition to preach my gospel. The scriptures clearly teach that the gospel we are to preach isn't the wisdom of the world, but the doctrine of Christ. While the gospel of Jesus Christ embraces all truths, not all truths are of equal value. The Savior clearly taught that His gospel, first and foremost, is His atoning sacrifice. His gospel is also an invitation to receive the blessings of the Atonement through faith in Christ, repentance, baptism, receiving the Holy Ghost, and enduring faithfully to the end. Just as I learned as a young man that grain was more appealing to our horses than a dirt-filled bucket, I also learned that grain was more nourishing than hay, and hay was more nourishing than straw, and that it was possible to feed a horse without nourishing him. As teachers and leaders, it is vital that we nourish those we teach and those we lead by focusing on the fundamental doctrines, principles, and applications emphasized in the scriptures and the words of our Latter-day Prophets, instead of spending precious time on subjects and sources of lesser importance. As a teacher, I have learned that a class discussion focused on the Atonement of Jesus Christ is infinitely more important than discussing topics such as the precise location of the ancient city of Zarahemla in today's geography. As a leader, I have learned that leadership meetings are more meaningful if our highest priority is an integrated effort to build faith in Christ and strengthen families and not simply just a correlated calendar. The Lord's words in section 50 contain a warning that if we teach by some other way than the way the Lord has directed, it is not of God. The Lord has taught those of us who serve in the Church to teach none other things than that which the Apostles and Prophets have written and that which is taught them by the Comforter through the prayer of faith. Does this mean that following the Savior's admonition to preach my gospel requires that every class we teach or meeting we lead be limited to teaching faith and repentance? President Henry B. Eyring responded to a similar question by answering, Of course not. But it does mean that the teacher and those who participate must always desire to bring the Spirit of the Lord into the hearts of the members in the room to produce faith and a determination to repent and to be clean. The second key to ensuring those we teach and lead are nourished by the good word of God is also found in the Savior's direction to preach my gospel by the Spirit, even the Comforter, which was sent forth to teach the truth. Not only are the Savior's words directing us to follow the guidance of the Spirit as we prepare and as we teach, He is also teaching that it is the Spirit that is the most effective teacher in any given situation. President Joseph Fielding Smith taught, The Spirit of God, speaking to the Spirit of man, has power to impart truth with greater effect and understanding and the truth can be imparted by personal contact, even with heavenly beings. Several months ago, I attended a training meeting where a number of the general authorities had spoken. After commenting on the excellent instruction that had been given, Elder David A. Bednar asked the following question, 
What are we learning that has not been said? He then explained that in addition to receiving the counsel that had been given by those who had spoken or those who would yet speak, we should also carefully listen for and record the unspoken impressions given by the Holy Ghost. The following statement from our beloved prophet, President Gordon B. Hinckley, provides additional counsel concerning teaching by the Spirit. We must get our teachers to speak out of their hearts and not their books, to communicate their love for the Lord and this precious work, and somehow it will catch fire in the hearts of those they teach. The Lord's words in section 50 of the Doctrine and Covenants also provide an inspired standard by which each of us can evaluate the effectiveness of our teaching, leading, and learning. In verse 22 we read, Wherefore he that preacheth and he that receiveth understand one another, and both are edified and rejoice together. My beloved brothers and sisters, with all of my heart I pray that each of us will take great care to nourish those we teach and those we lead by fortifying them with the bread of life and the living water found within the restored gospel. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. My dear brothers and sisters, one of the things which I am most grateful to my Heavenly Father for is the opportunity I had to work for 15 years as recorded in the Mexico City Temple. In this sacred place, as in all temples, ordinances are performed for the living and the dead by the power of the priesthood. In 1932, the prophet Joseph Smith received the revelations about the priesthood, and this greater priesthood administereth the gospel and holdeth the key of the mysteries of the kingdom, even the key of the knowledge of God. Therefore, in the ordinance thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. I have had wonderful experiences within the walls of the temple that verify this. In 1993, after serving as president of the Mexico Tuxla Gutierrez Mission, we traveled as a family to see my parents who lived in northern Mexico. During the trip, we talked about the joy of serving the Lord and seeing the change in people who had accepted the gospel during the three years we were in the mission. We were commenting about those people who were baptized, received the priesthood, and the ones we knew had entered the temple and were sealed as families for eternity. My youngest son asked a question that made me reflect. Dad, are you sealed to your parents? I told him that because my father had been less active for many years, he and my mother were not sealed in the temple. To help him become active, I thought up a plan. It involved my children, and I explained to them how we would do it. Every Sunday, my father would get up early to take my mother and sister to church, only to return home, wait for the services to end, then go back to pick them up. So I assigned my children to go with him and say, Grandpa, would you do us a favor? I knew his answer would be, whatever you want, my children. Then they would ask him, if he would go with them to church and stay with them so he could listen to the, their testimonies. It was the first Sunday of the month. I also knew my father would give any excuse not to go, so I planned to enter the room to help my children convince him. The time soon came for executing the plan. My daughter Susanna approached my father and asked him about the favor. Sure enough, my father told her he would do anything he could for them. Then came the invitation to go to church, and just what we had predicted, he used this excuse. I can't because I haven't even showered. That's when my wife and I, who were hiding behind the door, shouted, we'll wait for you. When we realized he was not making a decision, my wife and I entered the room, and together with our children began to insist, shower, shower. <laughs> then what we expected happened. My father came with us. He stayed for the services, listened to the testimonies of my children. His heart was softened, and from that Sunday on, he never missed church. Months later, at the age of 78, he and my mother were sealed, and we, his children, were sealed to them. 
Another thanks to the power of the godliness manifest in the ordinance of the temple, I can now be reunited with my parents for all eternity, even after death. Many times we don't comprehend the meaning of the ordinance of the temple in the fullness until after we have known affliction or passed through experiences that could have been extremely sad without the knowledge of the plan of salvation. When my wife and I had only been married a year and a half, she was ready to deliver our first baby. We had decided that she would have the baby in the Chihuahua colonies where she had been born. At that time, I was working in Mexico City, and we decided that she would be there a month ahead of the delivery date. I was planning to join her later. The delivery date arrived. I was at work when I received a call from my father-in-law. The news was good. Octaviano, your wife has given birth and you now have a little daughter who is beautiful. So in my happiness, I began to announce this to my friends and partners at work, who in turn asked me for chocolates to celebrate the birth of my little one. The next day, I began to give out chocolates throughout the four floors of our office building. When I reached the second floor, I received another call from my father-in-law. This time, the news was different. Octaviano, your wife is fine, but your daughter has passed away. The funeral will be today, and you don't have time to come. What are you going to do? I asked to speak with Rosa, my wife, and then asked her if she was okay. She replied that she was fine, depending on how I was feeling. Then we talked about the plan of salvation, remembered this scripture. And I also beheld that all children who die before they arrive at the years of accountability are saved in the celestial kingdom of heaven. I asked her, do you believe that? And she said, yes, I do. Then I replied, we should be happy then. I love you, and if you are okay with that, I'll take my vacations in two weeks, spend some time with you, and return back together to Mexico. We knew that one day we would be reunited with our daughter because we were sealed by the power of the priesthood in the temple. We ended the telephone call, and I resumed giving out the chocolates in my office building. Seeing me do this, one of my coworkers was surprised and asked me how I could do this after such terrible news. I answered, if you have three hours, I can explain to you why I'm not feeling too sad and about my knowledge of what happens after death. He didn't have three hours at that moment, but did later. We ended up talking for four hours. He accepted the gospel and together with his mother and brother was baptized into the church after receiving the discussions. I know that thanks to the power of godliness manifested in the ordinance of the temple, I will now be able to know my daughter. I will embrace her. I will be, I will be with, he, with her for eternity, just as we are now with our three surviving children. I rejoice in the words of Malachi. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest they come and smite the earth with a curse. This priesthood makes eternal families possible. It allows me, a son, to turn my heart to my father who passed away last year and to become in my hope through the Savior that I will see him again. This priesthood allows me, as a father, to turn my heart to our two children who die as infants and to be calm in my hope through the Savior that I will know them and they will know I was their earthly father as I look into their eyes and tell them I love them. It is this priesthood which has allowed me to see in the holiness of the temple how the power of godliness is manifested to all people who after exercising faith in Christ, repenting of their sins, and searching fervently for happiness, come to make sacred covenants with our Heavenly Father and receive His holy ordinances that bind on earth as well as bind in heaven. I love temple work. I know that God lives, that Jesus Christ is my Savior, and that President Gordon B. Hinckley is a true prophet. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, brethren.
choir and congregation will now sing, We Thank Thee, O God, for a Prophet. At the conclusion of the singing, elders Claudio D. Zivic and Douglas L. Collister of the 70 will address us. And following their remarks, we shall hear from Elder Stephen E. Snow of the Presidency of the 70 and Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, singing by the choir and congregation. This is the 177th semi-annual general conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I love this song. I have heard that no one has ever died giving a talk in a general conference. <laughs> if that is the case today, I sincerely apologize. <laughs> While serving in the required military service in Argentina, I read a book whose author I do not remember wrote. I choose not to be an ordinary man. It is my right to be someone out of the ordinary if I am able. To be someone out of the ordinary means to be successful, unique, and outstanding. That phrase has remained written in my mind and heart. My feelings were and are that we, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, have chosen not to be ordinary men and women. The last words, if I am able, made me think that it is not enough to go through the motion of being baptized and confirmed, but rather we have to fulfill and honor that commitment that we may with the Lord on that memorable day. Lehi taught his son Jacob, saying, Wherefore, men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given then which are expedient unto man, and they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil, for he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. Undoubtedly, freedom and eternal life are what we seek. We tremble at the very thought of dying and being captives of the devil. devil. Nephi taught us clearly what we ought to do. He said, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved, after all we can do. I believe that the first thing we have to keep in mind, doing all we can, is to repent of our sins. We will never be able to reach our divine potential if we remain in our sins. I have found memories of the day of my baptism when I was a year old. It was performing the Liniers Branch, the first chapel of the church built in South America. After my baptism, and as I was returning home, along with my family, my oldest brother started wrestling with me, as he often did. I exclaimed, do not touch me. I cannot sin. <laughs> as the day passed, I realized that it was not possible to remain sinless for the rest of my life. It is difficult to bear the sufferings that are inflicted upon us, but the real torment in life is to suffer the consequences of our own shortcomings and sins which we inflicted upon ourselves. 
There is only one way to rid ourselves of this suffering. It is by means of sincere repentance. I learned that if I could present unto the Lord a broken heart and a contrite spirit, feeling a godly sorrow for my sins, humbling myself, being repentant of my faults, that he, through his miraculous atoning sacrifice, could erase those sins and remember them no more. The Argentine poet Jose Hernandez, in his famous book, Martin Fierro, wrote, Man loses many things that later he may find. However, I should teach you, and it is good you remember, if shame is lost, it will be never recovered. If we don't experience the godly sorrow that results from our sins or unrighteous actions, it will be impossible for us to remain on the way of outstanding people. Another important principle to remember in doing all we can do is to look for and develop the opportunities that life within the gospel constantly offers us and recognize that the Lord has given us all that we have. He is responsible for all that is good in our lives. Another thing that must be our permanent responsibility is to do all we can do to share the gospel of happiness with all mankind. Some time ago, I received a letter from Brother Rafael Perez Cisneros of Galicia, Spain, telling me about his conversion. Part of his letter said the following, I had no concept of the purpose of life or what the family really is. When I finally allowed the missionaries to come into my home, I told them, give me your message, but I warn you that nothing is going to make me change religions. On this first occasion, my children and my wife were listening attentively. I felt separated from the group. I felt afraid, and without thinking, I went to my bedroom. I closed the door and began to pray from the depths of my soul like I had never prayed before. Father, if it, it is true that these young men are your disciples and can come to, to help us, please make it known to me. It was in that very moment that I began to cry like a smile child. My tears were abundant and I felt happiness like I had never before experienced. I was absorbed in a sphere full of joys and happiness that penetrated my soul. I understood that God was answering my prayer. All of my family were baptized, and we had the blessing of being sealed in the Swiss temple, making me the happiest man in the world. I think that this story should motivate us to do all we can do to share the blessing of joy that comes from living the gospel of happiness. The final concept I want to share is that we should do all we can do until the end of our mortal probation. Without question, we have living examples like President Gordon B. Hinckley and many other men and women who continue to faithfully serve at ages that others may consider inconvenient. When I served as President of the Spain Bilbao Mission, I was impressed with the quality of members and missionaries that I met who moved the world forward with great ability and love, as many faithful members of the church in other parts of the world. To all of them, I express my sincere respect and admiration. The Lord has said that he is delighted to honor those who serve me in righteousness and in truth and to the end. Great shall be their reward and eternal shall be their glory. May we always have in our minds and hearts the words of Nephi. Awake, my soul, no longer droop in sin. My soul will rejoice in thee, my God, and the rock of my salvation. It is my humble prayer that the Lord may bless us to do all we can do in this out of the ordinary path that we have chosen, which I testify to be true. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
Years ago, a man was accused of a serious crime. The prosecution presented three witnesses, each of whom saw the man commit the crime. The defense then presented three witnesses, none of whom had seen its commission. The simple jury was confused. Based on the number of witnesses, the evidence seemed to the jury equally divided. The man was acquitted. It was irrelevant, of course, that untold millions had never seen the crime. There needed to be only one witness. In the genius of the gospel plan, there ultimately only has to be one witness, but that witness must be you. The testimony of others may initiate and nourish the desire for faith and testimony, but eventually every individual must find out for himself. None can permanently endure on borrowed light. The restored gospel is not truer today than when a solitary boy walked out of the sacred grove in 1820. Truth has never been dependent on the number who embrace it. When Joseph left the grove, there was only one man on earth who knew the truth about God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. It is necessary, however, that each find out for himself and carry that burning testimony into the next life. When the 23-year-old Hebrew J. Grant was installed as president of the Tuella Stake, he told the saints he believed the gospel was true. President Joseph F. Smith, the counselor in the First Presidency, inquired, Heber, you said you believe the gospel with all your heart, but you did not bear your testimony that you know it is true. Don't you absolutely know that this gospel is true? Heber answered, I do not. Joseph S. Smith then turned to John Taylor, the president of the church, and said, I am in favor of undoing this afternoon what we did this morning. I do not think that any man should preside over a stake who has not a perfect and abiding knowledge of the divinity of this work. President Taylor replied, Joseph, Joseph, Joseph. Heber knows it just as well as you do. The only thing that he does not know is that he knows it. Within a few weeks, that testimony was realized, and young Heber J. Grant shed tears of gratitude for the perfect, abiding, and absolute testimony that came into his life. It is a grand thing to know, and to know that you know, and that the light has not been borrowed from another. Years ago, I presided over a mission headquartered in the Midwest. One day, with a handful of our missionaries, I spoke with an esteemed representative of another Christian faith. This gentle soul spoke of his own religion's history and doctrine, eventually repeating the familiar words, By grace ye are saved. Every man and woman must exercise faith in Christ in order to become a saved being. Among those present was a new missionary. He was altogether unfamiliar with other religions. He had to ask the question, but sir, what happens to the little baby who dies before he's old enough to understand and exercise faith in Christ? The learned man bowed his head, looked at the floor, and said, There ought to be an exception. There ought to be a loophole. There ought to be a way. But there isn't. The missionary looked at me and with tears in his eyes said, Goodness, President, we do have the truth, don't we? The moment of testimony realization when you know that you know is sweet and sublime. That testimony, if nurtured, will rest upon you as a mantle. When we see light, we are engulfed by it. Lights of understanding turn on within. I once conversed with a fine young man who was not of our faith, although we attended most of our worship services for more than a year. I asked why he had not joined the church. He replied, because I do not know whether it is true. I think it may well be true, but I cannot stand and testify as you do. I actually know it is true. 
I inquired, have you read the Book of Mormon? He answered that he'd read in the book. I asked whether he'd prayed about the book. He answered, I've mentioned it in my prayers. I told my friend that as long as he casually read and prayed, he never would find out worlds without end. But when he set aside a period for fasting and pleading, the truth would be burned into his heart and he would know that he knew. He said nothing more to me, but told his wife the next morning that he would be fasting. The following Saturday, he was baptized. If you want to know that you know that you know, a price must be paid, and you alone must pay that price. There are proxies for ordinances, but none for the acquisition of a testimony. I almost spoke of his conversion in these beautiful words. I have fasted and prayed many days that I might know these things of myself. And now I do know of myself that they are true. For the Lord God hath made them manifest unto me. When a testimony has been realized, there's a burning urge in the part of the possessor to bear that testimony to others. When Brigham left the waters of baptism, he said, the Spirit of the Lord was upon me, and I felt as though my bones would consume within me unless I spoke to the people. The first discourse I ever delivered occupied over an hour. I opened my mouth, and the Lord filled it. As a fire will not burn except the flame be revealed, a testimony cannot abide except it be expressed. Brigham Young later said of Orson Pratt, if Brother Orson were chopped up in inch pieces, each piece would cry out, Mormonism is true. Father Lehi eulogized his noble son Nephi in these words, but behold, it was not he, but it was the Spirit of the Lord which was in him, which opened his mouth to utterance that he could not shut it. The opportunity and responsibility for testimony bearing exists first in the family setting. Our children should be able to remember the light in our eyes, the ring of our testimonies in their ears, and the feeling in their hearts as we bear witness to our most precious audience that Jesus was truly God's own Son and Joseph was his prophet. Our posterity must know that we know because we oft tell them. Early church leaders paid a great price to establish this dispensation. Perhaps we will meet them in the next life and listen to the witness. When we are called upon to testify, what will we say? There will be spiritual infants and spiritual giants in the next life. Eternity is a long time to live without light, especially if our spouses and our descendants also live in darkness because there was no light within us and others, therefore, could not light their lamps. We should be on our knees every morning and night, pleading with the Lord that we never lose our faith, our testimony, or our virtue. There only has to be one witness, but it must be yourself. I have a testimony, and it urges to be expressed. I bear witness that the power of the living God is in this church. I know what I know, and my witness is true. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. When speaking of his mother, President David O. McKay quoted Abraham Lincoln, saying, all that I am or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. These words uh, well explain my feelings about my own mother. Viola Jean Goetz Snow, Jeannie to all who knew her, was born in 1929 and died shortly after her 60th birthday in 1989. She taught me and she encouraged me and she truly convinced me I could accomplish anything I wanted. She also disciplined me. As my own sons say now of their mother, she was the travel agent for guilt trips. <laughs> Mom was a wonderful mother, a great role model, and scarcely a day passes I do not think of her and miss her. 
A few years before she passed away, she was diagnosed with cancer, a disease she fought with great courage. As a family, we learned, strangely enough, that cancer is a disease of love. It provides opportunities to mend fences, say goodbyes, and express love. A few weeks before my mother's death, we were visiting in the family room of my boyhood home. Mom had fine taste and liked nice things. She also longed to travel, but our family lived on a modest budget, and these dreams were not quite realized. Knowing this, I asked her if she had any regrets. I fully expected to hear she had always wanted a larger, more beautiful home, or perhaps an expression of sadness and disappointment over never having traveled. She pondered my question for a few moments and replied simply, I wish I had served more. I was shocked at her response. My mother had always accepted church callings. She served as a Ward Relief Society president, Sunday school teacher, visiting teacher, and in the primary. As children, we were always delivering casseroles, jam, and bottled fruit to neighbors and members of the ward. When I reminded her of all this, she was undeterred. I could have done more, was all she said. Now, my mother had lived an exemplary and full life. She was loved by family and friends. She had accomplished much in a life that was often hard and which was cut short by disease and sickness. In spite of all of this, her greatest regret was she had not given enough service. Now, I have no doubt my mother's earthly sacrifice has accepted, been accepted by the Lord and that she has been welcomed by Him. But why was it foremost in her mind just days before her passing? What is service and why is it so important in the gospel of Jesus Christ? First, we are commanded to serve one another. The first commandment is to love God. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We demonstrate our love when we help and serve each other. President Gordon B. Hinckley has said, no man can be a true Latter-day Saint who is unneighborly, who does not reach out to assist and help others. It is inherent in the very nature of the gospel that we do so. My brothers and sisters, we cannot live unto ourselves. The Savior taught this to His disciples this important principle in Matthew. Lord, when saw we Thee and hungered and fed Thee? or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw thee, we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. This service is to be given unselfishly, with no thought of personal gain or reward and it is to be given as needed, not when convenient. Opportunity to serve may not always seem obvious, as it is human nature to worry about our own wants and needs. We must resist such tendencies and look for opportunities to serve. When we visit with those who are suffering from sickness, loss of loved ones, or other heartbreak, it is not enough to simply say, call if there is anything I can do. Rather, look for ways to bless the lives of others through seemingly simple acts of service. It is better to do even little th things of little consequence than to do nothing at all. Secondly, we have an obligation as members of the Church to accept callings to serve in building the kingdom of God on earth. As we serve in our various callings, we bless the lives of others. In missionary work, lives are changed as people learn of the gospel of Jesus Christ and receive a testimony of its truth. By the sacred work in the temple, we bless the lives of those who have gone on before us. In gospel service, we have the privilege to teach others, to strengthen the youth, and to bless the lives of the little children as they learn the simple truths of the gospel. In church service, we learn to give of ourselves and to help others. President Spencer W. Kimball, a great example of service, said, God does notice us, and He watches over us, but it is usually through another mortal that He meets our needs. Therefore, it is vital that we serve each other in the kingdom. The responsibility of service in the Church, however, 
does not relieve us of our responsibility to serve our families and our neighbors. President Kimball went on to warn, none of us should become so busy in our for formal church assignments that there is no room left for quiet Christian service to our neighbors. Finally, we have a responsibility to render service in our communities. We should work to improve our neighborhoods, our schools, our cities, and our towns. I commend those in our midst who, regardless of their political persuasion, work within our local, state, and national governments to improve our lives. Likewise I, likewise, I commend those who volunteer their time and resources to support worthy community and charitable causes, which bless the lives of others and makes the world a better place. My grandfather taught me at an early age the public service we render is the rent we pay for our place on earth. Service requires unselfishness, sharing, and giving. My wife and I learned a valuable lesson during our time of service in Africa. We were assigned to a district conference in Jinja, Uganda. Early Saturday morning, before our meetings began, we took the opportunity to tour a new chapel in the area. As we arrived at the building, we were greeted by a young boy of three to four years of age. He had come to the church grounds to see what was going on. Struck by his broad smile, Sister Snow reached at her purse and handed him a wrapped piece of hard butterscotch candy. He was delighted. We spent a few minutes touring the chapel be before returning outside. We were met by more than a dozen smiling children who each wanted to meet the new neighborhood candy lady. Phyllis was heartbroken as she had given the boy her last piece of candy. She disappointedly gestured to the children there was no more. The small boy who initially greeted us then handed the candy back to Sister Snow, gesturing for her to unwrap it. With a heavy heart, Phyllis did so, fully expecting the boy to pop the butterscotch candy into his mouth in full, full view of his envious friends. Instead, to our great surprise, he went to each of his friends who stuck out their tongues and received one delicious lick of the butterscotch candy. <laughs> the young boy continued around the circle, occasionally taking his own lick until the candy was gone. <laughs> now, one can argue the lack of sanitation with this gesture of sharing. But no one can dispute the example set by this young boy. Unselfishness, sharing, and giving are essential to service, and this child learned that lesson well. It is my hope and prayer we can all do more in giving service. If we fail to serve, we fail to receive the fullness of the privileges and blessings of the restored gospel. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Most of us have more things expected of us than we can possibly do. As breadwinners, as parents, as church workers and members, we face many choices on what we will do with our time and other resources. We should begin by recognizing the reality that just because something is good is not a sufficient reason for doing it. The number of good things we can do far exceeds the time available to accomplish them. Some things are better than good, and these are the things that should command priority attention in our lives. Jesus taught this principle in the home of Martha. While she was cumbered about much serving, her sister Mary sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. When Martha complained that her sister had left her to serve alone, Jesus commended Martha for what she was doing, but taught her that one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. It was praiseworthy for Martha to be careful and troubled about many things, but learning the gospel from the master teacher was more needful. The scriptures contain other teachings that some things are more blessed than others. A childhood experience introduced me to the idea that some choices are good, but others are better. I lived for two years on a farm. We rarely went to town. 
Our Christmas shopping was done in the Sears Roebuck catalog. I spent hours poring over its pages. For the rural families of that day, catalog pages were like the shopping mall or the internet of our time. Something about some displays of merchandise in the catalog fixed itself in my mind. There were three degrees of quality, good, better, and best. For example, some men's shoes were labeled good, $1.84, some better, $2.98, and some best, $3.45. As we consider various choices, we should remember that it is not enough that something is good. Other choices are better, and still others are best. Even though a particular choice is more costly, its far greater value may make it the best choice of all. Consider how we use our time in the choices we make in viewing television, playing video games, surfing the internet, or reading books or magazines. Of course it is good to view wholesome entertainment or to obtain interesting information. But not everything of that sort is worth the portion of our life we give to obtain it. Some things are better, and others are best. When the Lord told us to seek learning, He said, Seek ye out of the best books words of wisdom. Some of our most important choices concern family activities. Many breadwinners worry that their occupations leave too little time for their families. There is no easy formula for that contest of priorities. However, I've never known of a man who looked back on his working life and said, I just didn't spend enough time with my job. <laughs> In choosing how we spend time as a family, we should be careful not to exhaust our available time on things that are merely good and leave little time for that which is better or best. A friend took his young family on a series of summer vacation trips, including visits to memorable historic sites. At the end of the summer, he asked his teenage son which of these good summer activities he enjoyed most. The father learned from the reply, and so did all of us he told of it. The thing I liked best this summer, the boy replied, was the night you and I laid on the lawn and looked at the stars and talked. Super family activities may be good for children, but they are not always better than one-on-one -on -one time with a loving parent. The amount of children and parent time absorbed in the good activities of private lessons, team sports, and other school and club activities also needs to be carefully regulated. Otherwise, children will be overscheduled and parents will be frazzled and frustrated. Parents should act to preserve time for family prayer, family scripture study, family home evening, and the other precious togetherness and individual one-on-one -on -one time that binds a family together and fixes children's values on things of eternal worth. Parents should teach gospel priorities through what they do with their children. Family experts have warned against what they call the overscheduling of children. In the last generation, children are far busier and families spend far less time together. Among many measures of this disturbing trend are the reports that structured sports time has doubled, but children's free time has declined by 12 hours per week, and unstructured outdoor activities have fallen by 50%. The number of those who report that their whole family usually eats dinner together has declined 33 percent. This is most concerning because the time a family spends together eating meals at home is the strongest predictor of children's academic achievement and psychological adjustment. Family mealtimes have also been shown to be a strong bulwark against children's smoking, drinking, or using drugs. There is inspired wisdom in this advice to parents. What your children really want for dinner is you.
President Gordon B. Hinckley has pleaded that we work at our responsibility as parents as if everything in life counted on it because, in fact, everything in life does count on it. He continued, I ask you men particularly to pause and take stock of yourselves as husbands and fathers and heads of households. Pray for guidance, for help, for direction, and then follow the whisperings of the Spirit to guide you in the most serious of all responsibilities. For the consequences of your leadership in your home will be eternal and everlasting. The First Presidency has called on parents to devote their best efforts to teaching and rearing their children in gospel principles. The home is the basis of a righteous life, and no other instrumentality can take its place in this God-given responsibility. The First Presidency has declared that, quote, however worthy and appropriate other demands or activities may be, they must not be permitted to displace the divinely appointed duties that only parents and families can adequately perform, end of quote. Church leaders should be aware that church meetings and activities can become too complex and burdensome if a ward or stake tries to have the membership do everything that is good and possible in our numerous church programs. Priorities are needed there also. Members of the Quorum of the Twelve have stressed the importance of exercising inspired judgment in church programs and activities. Elder L. Tom Perry taught this principle in our first worldwide leadership training meeting in 2003. Counseling these same leaders in 2005, Elder Richard Scott said, quote, adjust your activities to be consistent with your local conditions and resources. Make sure that the essential needs are met, but do not go overboard in creating so many good things to do that the essential ones are not accomplished. Remember, don't magnify the work to be done, simplify it." End of quote. In General Conference last year, Elder M. Russell Ballard warned against the deterioration of family relationships that can result when we spend excessive time on ineffective activities that yield little spiritual sustenance. He cautioned against complicating our church service, quote, with needless frills and embellishments that occupy too much time, cost too much money, and sap too much energy. The instruction to magnify our callings is not a command to embellish and complicate them. To innovate does not necessarily mean to expand. Very often it means to simplify. What is most important in our Church responsibilities, he said, is not the statistics that are reported or the meetings that are held, but whether or not individual people ministered to one at a time, just as the Savior did, have been lifted and encouraged and ultimately changed." End of quote. Stake presidencies and bishoprics need to exercise their authority to weed out the excessive and ineffective busyness that is sometimes required of the members of their stakes or wards. Church programs should focus on what is best, most effective, in achieving their assigned purposes without unduly infringing on the time families need for their divinely appointed duties. But here is a caution for families. Suppose church leaders reduce the time required by church meetings and activities in order to increase the time available for families to be together. This will not achieve its intended purpose unless individual family members, especially parents, vigorously act to increase family togetherness and one-on-one -on -one time. Team sports and technology toys like video games and the Internet are already winning away the time of our children and youth. Surfing the Internet is not better than serving the Lord or strengthening the family. Some young men and young women are skipping church youth activities or cutting family time in order to participate in soccer leagues or to pursue various entertainments. Some young people are amusing themselves to death, spiritual death. Some uses of individual and family time are better and others are best. 
We have to forego some good things in order to choose others that are better or best because they develop faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and strengthen our families. Here are some other illustrations of good, better, and best. It is good to belong to our Father in Heaven's true church, to keep all of His commandments, and to fulfill all of our duties. But if this is to qualify as best, it should be done with love and without arrogance. We should, as we sing in a great hymn, crown our good with brotherhood, showing love and concern for all whom our lives affect. To our hundreds of thousands of home teachers and visiting teachers, I suggest that it is good to visit our assigned families. It is better to have a brief visit in which we teach doctrine and principle, but it is best of all to make a difference in the lives of some of those we visit. That same challenge applies to the many meetings we hold. Good to hold a meeting, better to teach a principle, but best to actually improve lives as a result of the meeting. As we approach 2008 and a new course of study in our Melchizedek Priesthood Quorums and Relief Societies, I renew our caution about how we use the teachings of Presidents of the Church. Many years of inspired work have produced our 2008 volume of the teachings of Joseph Smith, the founding prophet of this dispensation. This is a landmark among Church books. In the past, some teachers have given a chapter of teachings no more than a brief mention, and then substituted a lesson of their own choice. It may have been a good lesson, but that is not an acceptable practice. A gospel teacher is called to teach the subject specified from the inspired materials provided. The best thing a teacher can do with teachings of Joseph Smith is to select and quote from the words of the prophet on principles specially suited to the needs of class members and then direct a class discussion on how to apply those principles in the circumstances of their lives. I testify of our Heavenly Father, whose children we are, and whose plan is designed to qualify us for eternal life, the greatest of all the gifts of God. I testify of Jesus Christ, whose atonement makes it possible. And I testify that we are led by prophets, our President Gordon B. Hinckley and his counselors. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. As we conclude the conference, we express appreciation to the Tabernacle Choir, the Young Women Choir, and the Father and Son Choir and their conductors and organists for the beautiful and inspiring music. We also extend thanks to all who have participated in any way in these proceedings. Our concluding speaker at this session will be President Gordon B. Hinckley, our beloved prophet. And following President Hinckley's remarks, the choir will favor us with Sing We Now at Parting. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Paul K. Sabrowski of the 70, and this conference will be adjourned. President Hinckley. My beloved brethren and sisters, we now conclude a great conference. We've been edified, uplifted. We've been inspired and lifted to a higher appreciation of this wonderful gospel. The music, the spoken word, and the prayers have all been magnificent. We now return to our homes. If we are driving, let us be careful. Let no tragedy mark the experience we have enjoyed. All of the proceedings of this conference will appear in subsequent issues of the Ensign and Liahona. We encourage you to read again the talks in your family home evenings 
and discuss them together as families. They are the products of much prayer and meditation and are well worthy of careful consideration. Now the conference is adjourned for six months. We look forward to seeing you again next April. I'm 97, but I hope I'm going to make it. <laughs> May the blessings of heaven attend you in the meantime is our humble and sincere prayer in the name of our Redeemer, even the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.
our most kind and gracious eternal Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We, thy sons and daughters throughout the entire earth, have gathered together. Gathered together in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and have listened to the words of prophets, seers, and revelators, and other inspired speakers, and have truly been taught by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost, for which we express our profound appreciation. We are so very grateful for President Gordon B. Hinckley and express our love unto thee for him and ask thee to bless him and continue to provide for him strength that his great leadership may be felt through all nations of this earth and for President Monson and for President Irene, whom we also love so very much, and pray for them. We are grateful for the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and the Seventy and all leaders throughout the Church, throughout the world. This is a time of harvest in some areas of the world and a time of planting in other areas. May we use harvest and planting to balance our lives and to serve Thee. As we review these conference proceedings that we have been blessed with, may they distill upon our souls week after week as we apply in our lives that which we have learned. We pray for leaders of nations that peace will distill upon their souls. We ask for the gift of charity that as a people we might be known for charity. Dear Father, we pray that thy spirit will be with us as we go forth now and serve thee. And we do so so very humbly and in the name of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the 177th Semiannual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music was provided by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Communications. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.